Hello everyone, Rurikon here coming at you with another video and today we're going to be talking about Tales of Arise. This title was sent to me by Bandai Namco so I could give it a look and tell you guys my opinions on it, which I've already done. I live streamed the first chapter of the game and talked about gameplay mechanics, visual story, and my thoughts on the overall experience, and then I did a long form discussion video with Globku. But since then, I still haven't stopped playing the game. I got hooked first on the combat and then on the story, and now I'm basically completing every side activity I can find. And that includes fishing. And I haven't even beaten the story. So I guess you can say I'm pretty addicted to it. I just can't stop slamming Zoogles in the face with Kassar's massive shield, so therefore I need to make a video to justify the ridiculous amounts of time I'm sinking into this game. And that's why I'm bringing you guys a couple of tips which will hopefully help you out along your journey through Tales of Arise. Now this video is extremely late because I like to really sink my teeth into gameplay systems before I create any kind of guides. So if you enjoy this, if it helps you out in any way, consider leaving a like so that the algorithm doesn't just throw this in the garbage. As a matter of fact, if enough of you guys like this video, I'll make a fishing guide for Tales of Arise. <laughs> anyway, let's get started. One of the first things that I want to bring up is fast travel, because this actually confused me a little bit at the start. The way the fast travel works is as you progress through the game, you're going to start unlocking these fast travel points. And the way that you access this is at any point that you are out in the map, unless you're in some scripted sequence, which can happen sometimes, uh, if you're just out in the map, you press square, it's going to bring up a map. And then you might be looking through the map. And what I used to do at the very beginning is like I would go to the edge of the map and there would be like a link that would take you to the other map before that one. And and then, you know, I try to navigate my way back to the map that I wanted to, to be on. But there's a much more efficient way of doing it. And there's probably even like a legend in the game that tells you this. But, you know, I who pays attention to text that's on the game, right? But basically, if you, if you press triangle, it's just going to give you a list of every place that you've been to. And eventually, as, you know, you start unlocking more things, there's going to be like tabs that you can move left and right at the top that allow you to just like swap between different locations. And that is going to just slide a fast travel to anywhere that you've been. Because sometimes the maps are not directly connected. There might be elevators and stuff like that. And, you know, to me, that was a little bit confusing at the start. But like I said, it's a pretty basic thing and most people will get it. But just in case you got that wrong, then, you know, you press square, then you press triangle. And then it'll show you, like, all the places that you can go to. And this is very important because the next point is quest tracking and side quests. And even the, the importance of side quests. Why, why is this important? Because you might think, you know, it's a JRPG. Why do I care about side quests? Should I pick up side quests? What's the deal with them? Is it going to be easy to track? Because sometimes you know jrpgs will give you a side quest and they'll give you like nothing to go on they expect you to actually read the text and try to figure out what the hell's going on right i mean so far in tales of rise only been one quest that gives you like a couple of tips and lets you go off but that quest supposed to be kind of like a puzzle like a riddle thing for you to do but every single quest that you pick up in this game is easily trackable through the fast travel system and that's why i talked about fast travel before because you see if you just pick up a side quests and side quests are shown in the map whenever you're in a map you can actually see if there's like a letter symbol uh in that map if there's a letter symbol there's a side quest you should definitely pick it up you should pick all of them up um and i'll explain why in just a bit but like you pick up those quests and then if you go to the fast travel menu they'll show up as like hollowed out stars to mark that hey here's where you have to go to do this side quest that you picked up so you can actually just scroll through the different fast travel locations and it will show you exactly where you have to go in order to complete these quests and the other thing is in case you haven't been to an area in a while the game actually doesn't force you to go to every single area in the game to try and look for side quests because if there's a side quest available and you're in the fast travel menu, it'll just show up in that area with like a, a letter icon as well so that you know, oh, there's a side quest there that I haven't picked up yet. You can go there, you can pick it up, and then you can go to the fast travel menu and figure out where that side quest is. Naturally, if you want to track the main quest that is also represented in the uh, fast travel menu in the form of a yellow full star. So green hollowed star side quests, yellow full star main quest, and that's kind of how you can navigate and track the side quests. And now you guys might be wondering, okay, Rakan, but do I need to care about these side quests? Is this important in any way? And yes, 
because side quests actually unlock titles and titles you know it seems like something pretty useless but in this game titles are basically these pentagon symbols that you get on your skill tree and each of the titles will come with five skills that you can get for your character so you definitely want to unlock as many of those as possible because that's going to directly affect your progression so definitely do side quests and not just side quests there's other activities that unlock titles but do side quests if you can i mean you don't have to just be aware of the fact that you could be missing out on some pretty sweet uh skills for your characters Next up, let's talk about healing efficiency. So the way that healing works in this game is like very early in the game, your your main character, who's going to be the, the Iron Mask character, who you're going to very early learn that his name is actually Alfin. Uh, so Alfin is basically your, your main character that you're going to be playing, and he's got like a sword, and you hit people with your sword, whatever. He's just a melee dude, uh, for the most part, he has a couple of arts and stuff. But very early on, you're also going to get Xion on your team. So Xion is your first healer, and she basically can heal you. The only thing she needs is to have the, the resource to do it, which is AG. But every time she does a healing art, that also eats another resource that you have that is shared throughout the whole party that is called CP, or Cure Points. I think that's the name of it, Cure Points. So every time she heals you, you, you know, a little bit of that CP goes away. And that gets replenished whenever you rest at spots or in between, like, major story points. And there's even some things that, like, will restore your CP. There's also uh, orange gel that you can consume to restore CP so that you can continue to heal. Apple gel and so on and so forth. Now, the important thing about healing efficiency and why I'm bringing it up, this is very important early on in the game, gets a little bit less important as you move, uh, depending on the difficulty that you're playing. But as you move forward in the game, uh, healing efficiency stops being as important as it is early on. But early on, it is very limited, the amount of CP that you have. And if you die, if your character dies and Xion has to resurrect you because she can resurrect you, that is going to be a massive hit on your cure points. It's like 48 or something like that every time that you get rezzed. And you'll notice that like if you're dying a couple of times in a fight, that is going to drastically, you know, reduce your chances of being successful in that fight because Xion might run out of cure points for you. So something that I would recommend in the earlier levels of the game is like try to get as many life bottles as you can. This is basically like a phoenix down in Final Fantasy, right? You can resurrect the character using that. And at the start, I actually turned off resurrection because you can customize the actions. I'll explain how later in this video, but you can customize the actions of each of your party NPCs. And, you know, I just turned off her resurrection ability and I would resurrect myself with uh, a life bottle because, you know, that would be much more cure point efficient and that would allow me to last longer in fights without running out of healing. So that's just a suggestion that I have for you in terms of healing efficiency. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much that. So next up, let's talk about perfect dodging or parrying. So this is pretty much what the name says, and it's a mechanic in this particular Tales game. Uh, basically, if you dodge at the very last second before an enemy is about to hit you, you're going to do a perfect dodge. That is going to give you uh, certain power-ups for certain characters. Different characters have different things that will happen. I'll explain what uh, further in the video. But just be aware that if you are dodging and if you manage to dodge at the very last second, there's going to be benefits for that. And same thing if you're pairing. There's one character that doesn't actually dodge. She parries with a shield. She's also my favorite character, Kassar. She's freaking amazing. She's got a big ass shield. And basically blocking at the very last second is going to give you a similar effect to perfect dodging. This is something that you will want to practice because like I said, there's going to be a lot of benefits to it. But like if you're fighting a really tough boss, your first thought should always be get out of the way like don't worry too much about perfect dodging or pairing or whatever just get out of the way just be aware that that system is there and that system is going to be important because it is going to power up certain aspects of your character like the over limit that we'll touch up on um, a little bit later in this video so just be aware that this is a mechanic and try to practice it on like the easier monsters you know some of that early father monsters that you're getting uh try to practice a little bit of perfect dodging there a little bit of parrying there so that you have a little bit more practice when you're actually up against uh boss fights boost attacks 
Okay, so the way the boost attacks work is as you are fighting with enemies, um, you're, there's this little energy gauge that's filling up on the bottom left-hand side for every character in your party. Whenever that gauge fills up, you can basically do a boost attack. Now, these boost attacks are going to have uh, different effects depending on which character does them, but one of the things that you should keep in mind is that boost attacks can actually power through most enemy attacks. So say an enemy is about to do a really devastating attack to you, and you happen to have your boost attack, you might just be able to use the boost attack and, you know, power through the enemy's attack without taking any damage, while at the same time dishing out a significant amount of damage. Now, these boost attacks can be for either your character or any character in your party, including even characters that are not in your active party. So you want to keep an eye out on the bottom left-hand side of the screen to know which boost attacks you have available to you at all times. This is also going to be important for you to extend your combos, which we'll talk about combo extension a little bit further ahead as well. But for now, keep in mind, bottom left-hand side, boost attacks, use them as you are playing through the game. Earlier in the game, if you're not exactly sure when you should use a boost attack, it's like whenever it becomes available, just use it, okay? And then eventually you'll get a little bit more practice to it. Now, what do these boost attacks actually do based around which character is doing them? So Alfin, which is the main character, his boost attack is going to trigger a down on most monsters. You're going to see the text like break boost, and the monster's going to like fall down, and that is usually a very big opening uh, for big combos, so it just kind of gives you an opening in most situations. Obviously, boss fights are not going to be as pushovers as most of the monsters, but you'll definitely want to use Alfin's uh, boost attack as often as possible, and do remember, you can use it to power through enemy attacks as well. Uh, Shion's special attack, she is the one with the rifle, is going to uh, break flyers. So flying creatures, if you shoot them with Shion's boost attack, they're basically going to fall to the ground, and it's going to prevent them from flying for a little bit, so that again is a massive opening, particularly for fighting flyers, because they can be a little bit annoying to hit with melee characters. So Xion's uh, boost attack will bring them down and give you a significant opening to beat down on flyers. Rinwell's boost attack, she is a mage. She basically interrupts um, astral arts from the enemy. So the enemies can cast magic spells. There will be like a purple ball, uh, a purple circle filling up whenever there's an enemy casting an astral art. And if you use Rinwell's boost attack at that time, she's going to steal that magic art. And a really cool thing about Rinwell's boost attack is that it does not require you to target the specific monster that is doing the cast. Like if you see that there's a monster casting, but you're on a different monster, you can just tap Rinwell's thing. She'll steal the astral arts of all enemies that are casting and interrupt them. And it'll also cause them to fall down and lose their concentration, which again gives you openings to pummel on them some more. And if you're playing as Rinwell, you'll actually be able to use those spells that they were going to cast, which can be really, really powerful. So then you have Law. Law is a monk type character, so he basically punches and kicks everything, right? And his special boost attack breaks armored targets. So like targets with big shields, that seems like you can't just break them. Law will bust through them. Sometimes it'll be like monsters that have like heavy armor and stuff like that. You'll use law and you can break through that. They'll get down and you have massive openings to beat the crap out of them. But the important thing to also keep in mind is that you don't just have to save these for all of those things. Rinwells, I tend to save for whenever there's like an astral art coming out because astral arts can be quite devastating. But most of the other ones, I'll just use them on cooldown unless I know that there's a specific mechanic that I'm going to need to use them on. I'll just end up using them on cooldown because they're really useful to deal damage and extend combos. Now, Kisara, uh, she her special boost attack uh, breaks charging targets. So what does this mean? Some targets will like charge at you and stuff. And when they're doing that charge to do Kisara's thing, it'll break them and they'll fall over to the side. And again, you get massive openings. And then Dohalim, uh, he will trap fast-moving enemies. So some enemies later down in, in the game, they're going to be able to move too fast for you to keep comboing them. And you're going to need Dohalim special to trap them for a little bit so that you can actually extend your combos long enough to get into, uh, you know, some more advanced moves. Over limit. So this is a mechanic that can actually get triggered by you perfect dodging or pairing, which is why I've specifically said you should practice perfect dodging or pairing. And by the way, 
these mechanics get introduced gradually over the progression of the game. So if you still don't have access to like boost attacks or, you know, over limit and all of these things, don't worry. Some of them come a little bit later. Now, the way that over limit works is whenever you get hit or whenever you perfect dodge and parry, because even just getting hit can trigger over limit. Think of it like, you know, Final Fantasy's limit break. I mean, it even over limit limit break. You guys get the idea, right? Uh, whenever you are um, in the effect of over limit, your character effectively has infinite AG, which is that resource that lets you do arts, so you can spam all your arts to your uh, heart content. Now, the important thing you should keep in mind is also you want to diversify the arts that you do, because if you're using the same art over and over, it's going to reduce its effectiveness. So you want to use as diverse arts as you can to maintain the effectiveness of the art, right? Uh, but basically, during over limit, you know, there's a there's an amount of time that this lasts, and after it ends, it's over. But while you are in over limit, after you land an art attack, you can hold two art buttons, and your character will do a finisher attack. So whenever you're getting close to ending the over limit, you want to make sure that you hold those two buttons. And in case you're wondering, you know, oh, I keep missing the the finisher of over limit, then start hitting it earlier because. It is much more worth it to trigger the overlimit finisher than to continuously spam arts until you run out of the overlimit state. So let's talk about the different character playstyles because in Tales of Arise you can play multiple characters and each of them specializes in different things. So I want to give you like a brief description that'll maybe help you deciding which character you'll want to play because it's very easy to just like, hey, I've been playing Alfin this whole time. I guess I'll stick to Alfin and all these other characters are just like, you know, side characters that are here to help me. And if you never actually try these characters out you might now realize that you might like their play style better like to give you an idea uh kisara is, which is the one with the big shield i've basically been playing her ever since i got access to her in the game because i just prefer her play style much much more ideally if you want to really like min max to the nth degree you should learn how to play all of them because you would want to swap between them in order to extend your combos more but even me i'm playing like on the hard difficulty which is the highest difficulty that you can play when you start the game I'm still doing fine by just playing Kisara and just, you know, giving a couple of instructions to the other characters now and then. Uh, so you don't have to play all of them, but if you really want to min-max to your heart's content, then you might want to do that. So, very quickly, what is Alphen's playstyle? He's a jack-of-all-trades brawler, right? His, me his main mechanic is holding down the arts button to use a flaming sword attack follow-up, which also sacrifices his hit points. So he's really good at dishing out damage, he's really good at breaking monsters, and he's just like your basic brawler in, in these types of games. If you're playing Xion, now she is very interesting because she's both ranged physical DPS, she's a caster DPS, and she's also a healer. So she's got all of these things. She can cast spells like she's a caster class, she can basically shoot out special attacks with her rifle, and she has this unique mechanic where she throws bombs and then detonates them for different elemental damage types, which we'll talk about mastering the elements as well. But, you know, she has very unique mechanics. And on top of it, she also heals you. So she's a very powerful character. I don't tend to play her that much because I just like her healing me in the background and I just stick to dishing out deeps. Then we have Rinwell. And Rinwell is the one that you want to play if you're someone that usually tends to prefer mages in, in RPGs and JRPGs and stuff like that. Because Rinwell is basically your caster DPS. So her boost attack, like we said, literally steals other target spells and it interrupts them, it gets them down and all of that stuff. But the interesting thing is that after you steal another target spell, you can actually cast it. I believe that the mechanic for that is holding down R1. The game explains to you how this works, right? But you can hold down R1 and that will get you to cast an enemy spell, which say for instance, if you happen to be fighting a boss and you steal a boss's really powerful spell, and then you can just unload that spell on the boss. That's a uh, pretty beast. She can also store spells for instant casting later. So you guys know, usually caster classes, you have your little casting time. Then when you finish casting, the spell comes off. It hits the monster, deals big damage. Boom, right? The really cool thing about Rinwell is that you can keep the button pressed when you're casting. And then you press R1 and she'll store that spell in her book. And then what you can do 
is you can hold down R1 and instantly cast that spell. So you can start charging other spells and keep that one in your pocket to cast later. Or you can cast the same spell again after storing it in your book and she'll just cast an even more powerful version of that spell. So that's just a really cool uh, mechanic for casters and people that like playing mages. So if you like that, I would heavily recommend practice Rinwell, get good with Rinwell. It's very, very satisfying. Like I played all of these characters individually because there's actually like a, an arena in the game that has you do challenges, stuff like that. It's not mandatory for story progression because I know that some people don't like that, but you do get skills from doing those things. So I would recommend you doing those. Then we have Law, and Law, basically his whole thing is combo chaining. So he's very good at extending combos to the nth degree, right? Most of his attacks do multiple hits. He's all about the DPS. And his thing is that he is the fastest character to get to over limit. So basically, if you're dodging consistently with Law, even if it's just the, the CPU playing him, he is going to get more over limits than any other character. And it's cool because if you get the finisher on over limit, there's a chance that you'll do AoE depending on where the monster that you target was positioned. There's a chance you'll deal AoE damage and you can deal a ton of damage. This is one of the reasons why Law is a staple on my team because he gets so many over limit attacks during a fight. And that just like gives you tons of AoE damage and even just like moments to breathe where you know laws just going at it beating the crap out of everything and you're thinking okay what am i going to do next okay i'm going to do this boom 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 right i mean you can pause the game if you want to as well i'm just saying like i like the flow that law brings into battle he's a staple on all my teams i don't play him but the cpu is playing him get him to go over limit really really fast as well so he's just excellent at doing that so if you're someone that likes seeing limit breaks and all of that stuff law is kind of like the character for you melee dps beats the crap out of everything he's also like a high flyer too so you can go into the air do like tons of combos in the air you can juggle enemies and then bring them back down and juggle them again and he's really good at doing all of that stuff now kasara her main mechanic is parrying with a shield basically after you parry an attack with your shield it's going to boost up some of kasara's other attacks later down the line there's also some skills that give you increased aggro when you are blocking which is very useful if you are controlling kasara because you might be able to just keep getting aggro from bosses and bosses will keep attacking you while you're blocking and it gives your party time to like heal and do other things uh but don't worry about the parrying mechanic because i can imagine some people going like well if i have to parry i don't really want to play that class you know i only parry attacks every so often and kasara still deals enough damage she has really cool attacks that do multiple hits as well and she can perform just fine like any of the other characters and then finally, we have Dohalim. I actually don't know if there's more characters, because like I said, I haven't really finished the game up until this point. And Dohalim's thing is, he's kind of like Law, where he's all about doing massive combo chains. But the thing about him is that he's more about evading. So the way that Dohalim works is every time you get a perfect dodge, you go into a extended rod state, or whatever it's called, because he's got a staff. And whenever you get a perfect dodge, the staff extends, deals more damage. And then there's a bunch of passive skills that you can get on Dohalim that will increase, like, the damage. It will increase the critical chance, as well as the critical damage of whenever you are in this extended staff phase. And you can just beat the crap out of enemies that way. He is super fast. He's, like, dodging all over the place and attacking super fast and jumping and throwing targets in the air and juggling, doing all these crazy things. And on top of it, he also has healing skills as well. He's your secondary healer. But in my opinion, uh, I've had to use him as my main healer through a portion of the story. And in my opinion, I think that Shion is a much more uh, efficient healer. Though Halim just goes through like your cure points like nobody's business. I actually had to disable some of his healing spells because he was just going crazy. He's like, oh, heal you and heal you and heal you. And, and just like destroying <laughs> your CP. So... Yeah, that is like the the what you can expect from each of these characters. So now let's talk about extending combos and combo finishers. Because you see, the whole thing about Tales of Arise is extending your combo as much as you can. Which means you have to be fast, because if you even spend like, I don't know, 
uh, 200 milliseconds or something like that without touching the enemy, it'll in instantly reset the combo and you lose out on a lot of progress for that fight. So the way it works is when you start attacking an enemy, and again, these are systems that get unlocked further into the game, so if you haven't seen these yet, don't be surprised. I think these actually start unlocking around the time that you're going through the very first major dungeon of the game. But the way that it works is whenever you start hitting an enemy with arts, you'll notice that they have like this blue diamond that starts filling up. Once it fills up completely, you get to do a finisher attack that just destroys them in one hit. Like, doesn't matter how much health they have, it just destroys them. Which is why the system does not work like this when you're fighting like bigger monsters or bosses or something like that. This is mostly for like smaller monsters. But the cool thing is that the AoE damage from the finishing attacks will actually hurt every monster that is around you. So what you want to do in order to extend your combos as much as possible is you want to do your arts, right? Because arts deal damage and they'll extend combos and so on and so forth. But, you know, there's a limit to how many arts you can do depending on how many AG points you have. So in between your arts, you want to do your auto attacks or at the end of doing all of the arts that you want to, you want to use your auto attacks to continue extending the combo further and not let that combo drop. Then another thing that you can do is you can use the boost attacks that we talked about previously. Remember the ones on the bottom left hand side so that whenever you do all of your arts and all of your basic attacks, which usually each character has like a three attack chain, which can then get extended as you progress through the game, but usually like a three attack chain. So you'll do like art one, art two, art three, three auto attacks. And then it's like, you're screwed, right? Because if you haven't finished your combo by then, then you don't have anything else that you can do. But if you have a boost attack, you can call in another character or even your own character to do your boost attack and that is going to extend the combo. You're going to get more AG and you're going to be able to, once again, use your arts, use your auto attacks, use all of that stuff to continue attacking. And if you happen to trigger another boost attack, then you can extend it even more and you can continuously extend your combos to your heart's content so long as you have boost attacks and all of that stuff. And there's also, like I said, you can swap characters in between attacks. Like say for instance, oh, I'm playing with Alphen and I, you know, I ran out of actions that I can do. This combo is about to reset. You can try to swap the Shion and start shooting the monster so that, you know, the combo doesn't reset and then quickly swap back to Alphen because you'll have reset his stuff and be good to go again and continue using more arts and auto attacks and all of that. And again, your main objective when you're fighting smaller monsters is always keep the combo going. Keep the combo going because then you're going to get the finisher. And when you get the finisher, whenever you get a finisher attack, you'll notice that like everything lights up on the bottom left hand side. Then basically you get to pick which character is going to do this finisher. And that character will pair with one of the other characters in your party. And they'll both do like a finisher attack that deals massive damage and will one shot whatever it is that you happen to be fighting. It'll also deal AOE damage to everything that is around you. So, you know, whenever you're fighting these smaller monsters, your thing just becomes, okay, extend the combo, extend the combo, extend the combo, finisher. And then go again, extend the combo, extend the combo, extend the combo, finisher. That's kind of like the, the, the pacing of the thing. And as you progress through the game, you're gonna get skills that whenever you kill uh, an enemy, they're going to give you uh, almost as if you've done a perfect dodge. So that basically lets you instantly charge to another enemy and continue dealing damage. And it becomes like this really fast and fluid, satisfying combat system where it's just jumping from enemy to enemy and destroying all of them. Personally, I love it. This is one of the things that really has me hooked on the game. Now, a mechanic that becomes available to you once you reach the third area of the game is battle chains. So the way that this works is whenever you finish a fight with a group of enemies, you can instantly jump into another fight and yes, it'll start escalating the amount of rewards that you get from it, the amount of experience that you get from it. Like you'll see this counter on the top right hand side. And basically what this does is to me, at least it incentivized me that whenever I would get to a new area, I would quickly run to every monster that I could find and start killing all of them, not really stopping to gather stuff along the way or whatever. And I would just like kill everything in the area as fast as I could because monsters don't respawn until you rest at a camp. So you can just kill everything in an area and then go around and explore that area after you've done that and you will have gotten, you know, additional rewards, additional EXP and all of that stuff. So this is a system that you should also explore because you're gonna get more materials for crafting and things like that. So yeah, battle chains, pretty cool. Make sure to make use of them. 
Now, as I just mentioned, there is a mechanic for resting at camp. So what resting at camp does is it replenishes your CP, so the cure points. This allows you to get healed again. It also fully refills everyone's health in the party. It's a resting mechanic, right? Uh, during the resting, you can also cook for food buffs, and you definitely should. You should get your food buffs. Either you get, like, you know, elemental resistance, you get uh, additional drops from enemies. You can choose whatever buff you want, but make sure that you cook for food buffs because there's also additional skills that you'll unlock in the game by cooking. So cook as often as you can because eventually it'll start unlocking additional skills for your characters as well. Uh, do remember that whenever you rest at a camp, that's going to respawn all the mobs in the area, which, you know, it's also useful if you're looking to farm a specific mob or something. Uh, you can basically get them to respawn whenever you want, so long as there's a camp nearby. So now let's talk a little bit about those character skills. So character skills are basically passive skills and also active skills that you can get on your character skill tree. And you you basically unlock these new skills whenever you're doing anything. It can be main story quests, it can be side quests, it can be cooking, it can be uh, dealing com doing combat with certain enemies a certain amount of time. You'll unlock more and more skills for your characters and you'll want to look at them and make your decisions accordingly depending on what types of builds that you're doing. I'm not going to give you too many advice uh, on these skills yet because I don't consider myself to be an expert at it and I've actually struggled in quite a few fights in the game. So, you know, pick and choose according to what you think is going to work better for you. But keep one thing in mind that I personally wasn't aware when I started completing these, um, when I started completing the challenges, getting new skills and investing points into skills. Uh, keep in mind that uh, if you complete a whole pentagon of skills or a whole title, essentially, it's also going to give you a passive bonus on top of all of the other things that you get. Now, some of these bonuses will increase your defense, some of them will increase your attack, some of them increase your penetration, your elemental attack. There's a, a wide variety of bonuses that you can get from completing these trees. So pay attention to that. Like if you hover over the middle of the title, it will tell you what the bonus is for completing that. So if you really want to get that bonus, then complete the whole thing. If you don't want to get that bonus, then just get the skills that you want and then move on to something else where you can get a better passive bonus. But yeah, that's how character skills work. And like I said, remember, doing side quests can unlock character skills as well. Now, uh, another important thing is whenever you're doing combat and your characters are using arts, they can learn new arts. So that means you should experiment with different attacks. Even if you find an attack and you're like, oh, I really like this attack, this attack's really good. Every now and then you might want to swap it around and get a different attack because using this other attack might potentially unlock different arts. It'll also, there's also like a mastery system for each of the arts. Basically, don't rely too much on the same abilities like I'm probably doing in this video, just spamming the same two abilities with Kisara over and over because they're so goddamn good. But yeah, uh, you should definitely diversify your portfolio of arts. Don't play like I do because I'm not playing at peak efficiency, okay? Then, uh, managing your party. So you can choose which character you're playing, and you might be like, yeah, but I, al I always have to constantly swap between the character that I'm playing because it always starts me out as alpha. No, 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 no. You can change this. You can change this, and you can also decide who is in your party, who is not in your party. If you open the, the menu uh, where you can go to your items and all of that stuff, I don't know which button that would be on the Xbox because on PS5 it's the... It's a touchpad. I guess it would be the whatever the select button used to be. I guess now it's the back button on Xbox One. And don't even ask me what button it is on PC because I won't know. But uh, you guys know the one where you see your party and all of that stuff, right? And then if you press R1 in there, if you just look to the bottom, they'll tell you which button you have to press. It's the one that says edit. You press that button and that will show you uh, your party setup and you can choose which uh, party member goes where. Uh, the important thing about that is that also where you place your party members, that will be the D-pad button that you will have to hit in order to get the, the specific boost attack or the finisher attack of the combo. So keep those things in mind. And then there's going to be some people that will be outside of your party as well. And you choose which ones are outside, which ones are inside. And then you can press square to which one you want to be the default leader. And whichever one you hit there is going to be your default combat leader. But the interesting thing is that then when you come out of that screen, there's uh, another flag that you will notice, uh, which in PlayStation you can, press, you can press the square button to change that flag. And that will be 
your party leader. So it's not the combat leader, it's just the character that you're on the overworld with. So it is possible if you want to, you could, for instance, uh, run around the overworld as Alphen, and then when you start combat, the the actual leader of the combat would be like, say, Kisara. So that is possible to do. All you have to do is choose the different leaders in the different settings. So like on the base menu, you choose the leader there by pressing square. That will be the person you're running around in the overworld with. If you hit the edit menu and you see like the, the party formation and all that stuff, you press square there, that'll be the person that you default to when you go into combat. Now, on top of this, there's also a strategy um, tab that you might want to take a look at in case you want to, you know, further specify, specify the strategy of the characters that you are playing. You can really get down to nitty gritty and be like, oh, if there's two enemies, I want you to do this. If there's three enemies, I want you to do that. And you can really boil down the specific things that the party will do to a certain extent. Um... But personally, the one that I use is like the default one with a couple of changes, like I've been updating it to because at the start they say, oh, whenever my own HP is below 50%, use apple gel and apple gel is worthless later on. You'll need to use like peach gel or lemon gel or whatever. So I just keep updating that and I use mostly the default one, but I have swapped it around from time to time. Like I've played around with the idea of... Um, you know, only using healing arts when I was below 25% health to conserve CP a little bit more. And there's some more specifics that you can do in there. So you might want to mess around with the strategy a little bit. If you are struggling, that can help you. But even beyond that, if you go to your art screen, this is the one that allows you to change the different arts that you apply to your main character. You can also choose which arts the characters are able to perform when the NPCs are controlling them. So this can be useful in certain situations, which we'll talk about in just a couple of minutes here. Uh, but basically you get to choose. So it's like, oh, I don't like you using this art because it's not as effective. You can turn that off. Uh, and then the character won't use that art. Like one of the things that I did for a while was I turned off the resurrection spell from Xion and I manually resurrected everybody with life bottles to preserve my CP so that I could last longer as I was moving through like a particularly challenging area or something like that, right? But again, this is something that you can just like min -mat, mix and match however you prefer. And finally, one of the uh, most important things is mastering the elements because this game has an elemental opposition system. So you can actually see the element of a monster. I feel like this is not properly explained within the game, but basically whenever you are in combat, you can hold down L1 and this will show you the element of a monster if you look at his uh, health bar. Not every monster or boss is going to be attuned to certain elements. But if they are, then you can take certain um, steps to ensure that you have a bit of an edge against those monsters. So for instance, if you're fighting an earth monster, you'll want to use wind type attacks because they directly oppose earth. And vice versa, if you're fighting a wind monster, you'll want to use earth type attacks. Then if you're fighting a water monster, you use fire. If you're fighting a fire monster, you use water. And that will give you additional damage. Also, if you use the same element that the monster is attuned to, that is going to deal less damage. So, you know, depending on how much you are struggling with certain monsters, you might want to tell, you know, go to the, the specific art selection on a character and just go like, okay, don't use earth attacks against this earth monster. And you just turn off all of the earth attacks and then the character will be more effective. If you want to go a step above even, you might just go only use wind arts. Although I don't always go that route. Sometimes I play around with that. And then there's also obviously uh, things that you can craft like charms and weapons and, and whatnot. And certain charms will actually give you like 50% resistance to a specific element. Those can also be very useful and I've used them to uh, great success on some of these bosses that use a lot of elemental attacks. So play around with the elemental system uh, and you will see that that is going to be something that can give you a significant edge uh, in combat. Uh, another important thing is uh, make sure to save before big bosses because unfortunately, sometimes uh, you might encounter enemies that, and you don't know what their level is. So you'll be like, yeah, sure, I'll try to take on this guy. And then it's like, oh, I'm level 10. This enemy is like level 50. Oops. And they don't even let you flee. Like, you'll just die. And this can be annoying. And sometimes also like you'll be, okay, so I'm level... I know, 35, and there's like a level 40 mob here. Maybe I can take him, and then you take your shot and you lose, right? 
And but you've used a bunch of consumables, which sucks because you lose those consumables. So whenever you know that you're going to fight like a big boss, my advice would be save because that way, even if you use consumables, you can just be like, ah, oh, whatever, I'll just reload my save, have all of my consumables, I've done my experiment, I know what I need to do against this boss, or I need to level up more, I need to do something. So always, always, always save before bosses so that you can use consumables at your leisure, and then if you don't get through the boss, you still have all of your consumables, you just have to reload your previous save, okay? Keep that in mind. And then finally, really the, the final point, this video is already way too long, Crafting weapons and accessories. This is super easy. You kill monsters, you get materials, you go to a blacksmith, you craft the weapon. The game actually does a good job of telling you how to craft weapons. And then you can also craft accessories. So you go and you will gather ores as you are going through the world. And these ores will have random properties. You can go to a, what are they called? Engravers. You can go to an engraver and tell them, okay, I want you to craft me an accessory. And he'll tell you, okay, here's the skills that you can get from this accessory, right? And... An important thing is after you craft it, you don't instantly get all the skills. You'll get like the base skill of that accessory, but in order to get more, you'll have to enhance it. And that basically means you go to a different menu, enhance accessory, and then you will consume like crappier accessories that you don't actually need. And that will just like power up this other accessory to have a ton more effects. You should experiment with this. Just keep in mind again, you have to enhance accessories to get the full effects of that specific accessory. And then my final tip, never sell your weapons. I did this and I've regretted it because what ends up happening is, like say for instance, oh, I got a better weapon. This just deals more damage. It's, it's pretty much a no-brainer, right? Yes, the thing is, later down the line, in order to craft certain weapons, you're going to need the previous version of an older weapon. So you might have to craft the weapon twice if you sell it before, which is not terribly hard, but still, if you just keep all of your weapons, you'll never have to do that, and the weapons don't even sell for that much money, so it's not really worth it for you to sell your weapons. So, never sell your weapons. And another thing, weapons also have elemental attunement. So, whenever you're fighting a boss, you might sometimes, sometimes it's worth it to use a lower damage weapon that has the right elemental attunement. So, like, if you're fighting a wind boss, you'll get an earth-type weapon, that might actually give you more benefit than using the uh, the weapon that deals more damage. But anyways, that is it for this video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully it helped you in some way. Uh, I know that this is probably not going to get a lot of views because I'm super late uh, with this particular topic. But uh, I just wanted to do it because I've just been enjoying Tales of Arise so much. And uh, yeah, thank you all very much for watching. If you made it this far, I'll see you guys in the next one. Stay strong. Stay safe. Peace out. Commander of Heaven, Phoenix Cyclops!